Thank you. So uh, the internal lighting talks is this moment where the GSOC and outreach interns have a chance to speak to the broader community in our project. Most of them are working silently with their mentors and now is the, change that, the chance that they have to, to speak to you all. Uh, I hope you all are going to welcome them warmly because it's their first time. Most of them are going to be speaking for the first time, so let's, let's celebrate them. Uh, please come to stage. Hello. <laughs> Hi. My name is Andre, and throughout this summer of code, I have worked on a new feature for GNOME games, namely the Safe States Manager. Okay. <clears throat> My mentor for the project was the applications maintainer, Alexander. Alexander? Who. <clears throat> I won't try to pronounce his full name because I doubt I can do it properly. He's an awesome guy. You can meet him often in newcomers channel. Okay, so GNOME games along with this external library called RetroGTK act as an emulator front end, which means that the app basically comes bunched together with emulators, with a couple of emulators for uh, old video game consoles and <clears throat> Thus, it allows the user to play uh, old retro games on a regular computer desktop, Dex desktop computer. Okay. For example, a classical Asteroids game for the Game Boy Advance console. Okay. Now, what are save states? So, emulators have an internal representation of the console's memory, RAM, registers, whatever, and <coughs> This data can be dumped in a file on the disk and later can be the emulator state can be restored from these files and thus games can be paused and resumed using these save states. To the user, these save states feel like regular game saves. <coughs> Except they're on steroids. By that I mean the fact that uh, save states do not care about the game's logic regarding saves. So a game could support saves only at checkpoints or could have a limited number of slots. But uh, save states don't care about that. Their, your user can have an unlimited number of save states and they can be created at any point during the game. That's their main characteristic feature. Oh, oh okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, this is an overview of the this is an overview of the Safe States Manager, the project I have been implementing throughout the summer. Uh, the, this is the UI. It would work exactly as you'd expect. There's the new Safe State button, a load button, a delete button, pretty much like a regular Saves Manager for a regular video game. Uh, with that being said, the Safe States have three main characteristics. One is that they can be created at any point during the game. That's the steroid pipe. That's the steroids part, as I, as I already mentioned. Size of, the size of a save state can vary wildly based on the platform. A save state for uh, Game Boy can, uh, will occupy a different, sp a different space on the disk compared to a save state for the PS1 or for the PS2 in the future when games will support the PS2, for example, or even the PS3 in a later future. And finally, save states affect regular game saves. I won't go into the details of that now because it's not the most simple mechanism. My personal recommendation would be when playing a game to use either, say, either the save states offered by GNOME Games, either to use the regular game saves used by the game. Don't mix them because the behavior can be unexpected and you might lose data. And with that being said, this, is, this was my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And this was my good project. Listening, <laughs> I'm a little bit small. <laughs> um, so, uh, my name is Clarissa. I'm from Brazil. Okay. 
Uh, I th are, can you listen to me? Yeah, it's okay. Um, I'm a software engineering student, and uh, actually, my my area of of working through Outreachy was not exactly what I work with in my university, but I decided to work with usability just to get to know uh, and to contribute to GNOME uh, as I think I could. So what is usability? Usability uh, usually is not uh, only related to software, but uh, is the ability the users have to uh, to really use the things like uh, using things should be something uh, intuitive so uh, uh, why usability usability focuses on uh, users and sometimes users uh, have hurry and they want to produce uh, and they don't want to spend too much too much time uh, learning how to use the software. They want to get, they want to see it, and they want to know how to use it without thinking. So uh, I'll give some tips about uh, how to do usability testing on your own. Um, uh, you have to first decide what you want to know. Uh, from the user, like uh, you see a design and you want to know what the user uh, thinks about uh, doing. So, uh, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> uh, you want to, for example, see uh, a note program. So you want to know what the user thinks when he is writing a note. And then you write tasks about it, like you have to put the user in a contest uh, and context, yeah, environment, like he, as if he was using the, the software on his own. And then you, you decide what usability test uh, you should apply on that, that, that context. And then you, rep you reproduce the steps like as if you were uh, accomplishing the tasks and then you find out how many users do you need. In my case, I used always five users because uh, five were enough to cover all the applications and, and then you run the tests and you analyze the results. For example, uh, the testing notes. I wrote some tasks and then uh, the tasks were covered. Uh, creating a note, searching for a note, and changing the view for the notes. Uh, this is an example of a scenario. Your notes look messy and you want to keep them separated from each other. Please create a notebook called To Do's and a notebook called grocery lists and place cor uh, the correspondent lists inside them. And then uh, I had to decide how many testers do, did I need. Here you can say you can see that in this graphic, uh, usually five users are enough to cover uh, um, a good amount of the application, and then more than five it becomes a little bit. Uh, too much for the application and uh, sometimes running a new test you will discover the same things you knew, you already knew and that's it. And then you run the tests. I usually applied a questionnaire for, to know uh, the kind of user, like um, if it was, it's gender, it's age, it's uh, computer famili familiarity. And then I gave a brief explanation about what the software was, and then I explained it, uh, the, to the user that uh, I was not trying to test him, I was trying to test the software usability. And then I read the scenarios to the user and watched him trying to accomplish the tasks I've told him. 
And then when I was analyzing the results, I tried to see what the user thought during the, the test, like where he, he first tried to, to click and then, uh, okay. And then I had this heat maps where I could analyze the results. Green is where you imagine the user went well and black is where the user couldn't uh, accomplish the task. And that's it, that's, it, that's it. I will have another talk on on Sunday, and then you I'll give another, uh, more details about my work and how to do usability testing. Thanks. Sumed from India. I'm a Google Summer of Code student. I worked on no music project this summer, mentored by John Felder. And uh, actually it was like mentored by many people because I had to work in different libraries, Tracker, Tracker Miners. So it was like I had so many mentors. So I'll just start with the slides. So first, the idea behind the project is in the no, in no music, you get this problem. You see unknown artists, you see unknown album. Why? Because no music is heavily dependent on tags for its good performance. So the idea is where, where do we get these tags? If a file doesn't have, if, if you upload a music file in the no music and application and you don't get tags, what do we do? So there's a solution. You can use open source databases like music brands, Acosta ID. There's plugins involved. You can use them to retrieve metadata tags for them. Bonus point, you can also retrieve cover art. So even if you have some unknown file, unknown, the unknown anything, you can get tags for them. So this, this was the goal behind the project. Now before the project, now uh, actually there are many things involved here. Tracker restores uh, data, uh, identifiers and metadata. Uh, Jirilo will provide the plugins. So this was the work before the project. Um, now you can see these are my contributions. So like in each library, I had to add something new to make it functional, like uh, like music brands in mu to access music brands data, you need music brands identifier. So in tracker, I had to store music brands identifier. In tracker minus, I had to retrieve music brands identifier, and in Jirilo plugins, I had to use those data identifiers to retrieve metadata. So this was all the work that was done. Finally, end result was user can go to any song. He can click edit details. And once you click edit details, this blue suggestion, cyan suge uh, color suggestions you see, that are the, th those are the suggestions we are providing using open source uh, databases like Music Brains Acoustic ID. We are providing those suggestions. He can either use those suggestions or he can manually edit tags also. So this is a pretty cool feature to have for song. Uh, if, he if he thinks suggestions are not good, he can write his own title, his own album or anything. Uh, and the idea is once he submits, uh, when he's, once he saves this, we, we want not just to update the tracker, not just to update locally, we also wanted to update the file. We wanted to update this uh, data or cover art in the file also. So what is, what, what much, how much is done? Uh, these are all the things I have tried. I mean, these are all working. Out of these first two tracker, tracker minus part, acoustic ID pl plugin part, all this part is merged uh, as part of the respective library. And these parts I have tried, they are working successfully. I am able to retrieve cover art for any file. I am able to retrieve tags using Acostady plugin. I am able to edit tags manually. I am able to save in trackers. Uh, all these things are done, but they are still uh, there in review. So there's still some time for them to get merged. So what is the future plan? Future plan is, first of all, um, we want uh, music brand sub support also. Like right now, it's fully working with Acostady. Uh, music brain is similar uh, uh, database, so we want that support also. We want write back support. And there's some additional like far ahead goals like we want, um, in this we want user should be able to click the cover art and choose his own image as cover art. And uh, we want to add missing files in album. So these are all the future goals I have. So that's pretty much it. Thank you everyone for supporting me. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, 
hello everyone i'm shreeshtha from india and i have been working on gnome boxes for this summer so about me i'm a pre final year uh, computer science student at bits pilani hyderabad campus and i started contributing to gnome this february with the help of my mentors about gnome boxes okay so uh, gnome boxes is used to view access and manage remote and virtual machines currently it it, it supports express installations but the express installations are either like uh, um we it's the isos are already downloaded or gnome boxes offers an option to download an op iso and perform express installation on it so if express installation is like a new word it's basically is unattended installations like all the suggestions like uh, the disk space everything will be done automatically you don't have to set it manually so a goal of our project uh so what we want to do is we want to support network tree based express installations in gnome boxes so uh what how would this benefit us it would actually reduce the download size of the uh media actually we we uh, we will not be downloading the whole media for creating a virtual machine we'll actually be just getting the pack uh, the things required to uh, create to create a virtual machine from a network tree location so that would like uh, reduce the download size and it would mainly benefit the users with low internet connections okay so uh, the progress made so far so um, we we have actually uh, identified the uh, operating systems that would uh, that would support tree based express installations out of all the operating systems so th currently there are around 18 of them and we uh, we have gotten the kernel and initrd paths from the installation trees uh, for those operating systems so this we had this challenge while we were trying to uh, get the kernel and initrd path uh, then we realized there are two types of installation trees one is the one that uses tree info so for that we need to uh, uh, read the kernel and init rd path from the dot tree info file and the other is that points directly to the kernel and init rd so for that uh, in um, the path should be manually set in os info db uh, example of this is debian and ubuntu distros and uh, we have, we have successfully uh, like uh, got in the script and command line for installation trees and this similar feature is already there in bert install so we uh, uh compared the command line generated in gnome boxes and uh, the one in bert install to verify if it was coming out right and also we uh, while while working on the project i found out few bugs and we 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 are we fixing it so work in progress and plan ahead so we basically want to expand all the methods that are used for media to support the download of uh kernel and init rd paths from from the network from a location that is like http location initially we are doing it but we are we are doing it from a downloaded file but now we want uh, the the support to be there to download it from a http location and uh, we'll have to refactor the class that actually re revolves around the media now and uh, so we we don't want this feature to show up explicitly we want to like uh, there's this download and os page in gnome boxes so we want to merge this feature into that option only so uh, the user won't be able to actually see if it's a tree based installation or the media based so uh, because that's actually not required so we'll just merge this feature into download and os page so that's all thank you Okay. Hello everyone. My name is Stefanos and I apologize in advance for the ugly slides because I created them like 20 minutes. I didn't know about the internship lightning talks, but I wanted to present you what I've done. Um so I worked on the Polari internet relay chat and my mentor for this project was uh, Florian Milner, who is also the one that started this project. And yes, 
let's start. So um, the first thing, the hardest thing when it comes to um, creating a preview link is probably selecting that image, that thumbnail that is going to uh, accurately represent the content of that web page. For example, a logo or uh, something. This can vary and like parsing HTML or something to detect images contained in the web page is too hard and in some cases it might not be possible. So we thought a good idea would be to actually just load the web page somewhere in the background to take a snapshot of it. And this is what we did. We used the web kit, the, the web view had a, it had a function that returned a surface. And then we would write, write it to a PNG. And at first we tried it and it worked pretty fine for any type of uh, web pages. But the problem was uh, with the images because um, we would create a web view large enough to capture the, uh, we would create a web view large enough to create, to capture the entire web page. We would get a snapshot of it and then we would resize it to a thumbnail size. But the problem is when it comes to images or videos, you know the web page is actually like a lot of black, especially in the case of small images and then the images in the center. If you do this in, in that case, then you're going to get a really ugly uh, image and then after you resize it, it's going to be so small you won't actually see anything. So here I have the example using a big web view. So the result after scaling down for web pages, for example for YouTube and then for images with the Polari logo and then using a small web view, um, uh, oh, sorry. So we thought that um, in the case of images, uh, we could use a small web view. The problem was generating a general rule because obviously if we used small web views, this is what would happen with the web pages. The entire image wouldn't be caught inside. So that's why we, uh, we, uh, we thought we, s we should detect the content type and based on it, if it is an image, then we apply the image uh, treatment else we just uh, use the other. Um, this is a post um, from my blog and uh, like these are some uh, uh, previews from some images. For example, on the left, on the bottom left, you can see that was an image and this is how it looks. And the other two are just websites. And then I will, th these are some other steps. I, I, di I didn't really want to go into detail because everything is basic here. I wanted to talk about the more important part about choosing what to preview. I, uh, another thing we did was create a GeoSub process that runs the actual script I talked about earlier because in case something crashes or anything, we don't want to actually crash Polari. Uh, there was also setting a placeholder image in the case an image was not found in cache. And also until the generation is complete, here is another step I didn't add because I was rushing. Uh, the G file monitor, we would wait until the generation is complete and that would send the signal to the Polari and then it would load the image. And here are some final results how the, how previous looked after I ran them on the actual Polari. So these are messages sent by others. And this, for example, for some commits. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. So I guess now we have a coffee break in the schedule, but I would like to ask the mentors and the interns to stay here so we can take a group picture, please. Can the interns and the mentors come to the stage, please?
Wait for one photo altogether. Altogether. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's way worse than only having one. 